Marsha Reed, an elder here at Summerlin Church. And once again, I'm filling in for our beloved Joyce McCullough, who has had surgery and is at Cottage Hospital and has been there for a week and is going to be there for a few more days. She's doing well. Steve visited her yesterday. Um, and she's asking that the hospital is asking for no visitors. So I've been texting her, and she's doing well. This is the first Sunday of Lent. For centuries, we've observed the season of Lent. This is a 40-day season in which we remember Jesus' journey to Good Friday and Easter. For many people, this has been a time for increased discipline and focus, which includes times of fasting and prayer. In more recent years, there's been an emphasis on taking on positive practices that is intentionally increasing our service to others in a way to follow Jesus. Today's service will focus on the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. We will draw lessons from his experience and think about how we might deepen our own faith journey this season. After the sermon, we will be given the opportunity to come forward for an anointing of oil as a sign of Jesus' presence with us in this journey. So now, in this time of reflection, you can ask yourself, in what dimension of my life do I want to draw closer to God? Am I facing a change in my life and need God's help to know what to do? Am I wanting to change some personal habit or behavior? Do I want to simply be open to God's guidance in deepening my spiritual journey? 
Let the Holy Spirit speak to you now as we enter the silence. printed in our bulletin. Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem. His purpose is clear. And we are invited to join him on his journey. We follow with humility and gratitude. Amen. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn, Oh, How Great Thou Art. Sings my 
in this morning and let's let's <laughs> sing that together you'll find By this freedom, 
join me in the prayer of confession as it's printed in the bulletin. And this is a very simple confession written by a woman who writes liturgy at uh, Iona in, in Scotland. God of all, we confess that we do not like to confess. It makes us feel vulnerable. It reminds us that we are fragile and flawed. It calls us to admit to you, ourselves, and others that we need to change. God of all, we confess that we do not like to confess. We ask for your forgiveness and your help because we know confession is good for the soul. Amen. So let's take a moment in silent confession, anything that's on our soul that we just want to lift up to God and ask for forgiveness. Amen. Fast comes the forgiveness. Before the syllables have made a sound, your confession clears the way. God holds no grudges, so let go of your grief. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's sing the glory of pottery, shall we? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. May be seated. And if the ushers would come forward now, we'll receive the offering supporting the work of the Summerlin Church. I keep flying voices in my mind that say I'm not in I 
think I am weak, but you say I am held when I'm falling short, and when I don't belong, you say I am yours, and I believe, oh I believe, what you say of me, I believe, oh I believe, yes I believe. What you say of me, I believe. Let's stand and sing the doxology, shall we? pray. God, take this our offering and take the, the, the gifts that we have, the time we have, the decisions we're going to make. Show us all how to use that to build your kingdom and show it to the world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. First of all, I just want to say it's really good to be back in person here. Um, rotator cuff, doing great. Uh, no floods today, at least till later. Got that COVID thing behind me. <clears throat> and I miss being here, so it's great to be with all of you. I can always watch from home. Um, but there's something special about being in this space. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the wonderful spirit of the Summerlin Church where People have other things they need to attend to, so we have all kinds of folks who come to the help and all the wonderful musicians. Uh, Kathleen is off on a trip with one of her daughters looking at colleges far away, and so a wonderful group of musicians just say, oh, we'll, we'll take care of everything. And um, that spirit of, of um, what can I do to help is a great thing. So um, today, when we come to this, uh, this day, this is the first Sunday of Lent, and um, as uh, Marcia said in the introduction, Lent has a long history. Um, and I'm going to take my take on it today. Um, it is, I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of intro before I read the scripture, uh, because the um, scripture today is the Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And it talks about the devil. So I want to focus a little bit on that uh, before I read it. Um, think of the devil and Satan and Hebrew Hasatan, the adversary, evil, those kinds of things. Um, and I'm going to explain why I'm not going to spend a lot of time focusing on that in itself. One reason is years ago, I, in my first church up in Washington, um, I preached on a passage from Mark's Gospel about Jesus uh, driving out an evil spirit of some man. and. Um, after the service, very uh, politely, one of the folks came to talk to me, um, and uh, he was an elder in our church, and he and his wife had brought their son to worship that day. And um, their son had, uh, was a brilliant young man, but in his early 20s, he had a psychotic break, and uh, became bipolar, and had struggled with, uh, with his mental health ever since. And uh, they had brought him to church that day, and here I was talking about evil spirits, and um, it brought back a memory uh, that once when he was in the beginning of this illness, some well-meaning folks had taken him aside and said, we're gonna exercise, the devil is in you, we're gonna drive that devil out. So they did an intense prayer time with him, and when it was over, his mental state had not changed. But instead, he became convinced that the voices he was hearing were there. 
from their evil. And so he was traumatized any time he'd hear those stories. So I became sensitive to what that, um, to talk about that uh, casually is, is not wise. Um, secondly, I have what I've been calling recently with our team, this is not very profound, but it's called um, my, my sand trap rule of spiritual life. Um, and here's the way it goes. If uh, some of you have played golf, uh, I'm sure some of you have played and quit, I'm glad to never play again. Some of you play with joy and enthusiasm. But um, golf is very much, like a lot of sports, but very much a, a, a mental game. Uh, what your attitude is, what you're framing, what you're thinking. There's so many things you can think about. Um, but one of the most basic things is that um, the advice that teachers will give is that if, if you've got a shot and there's a sand trap and then there's the green, most of us will say, okay, the one thing I don't want to do is hit into the sand trap. And supposedly, in sports psychology, there's an idea that um, your, 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 your unconscious doesn't necessarily listen to all the things we say, it's, it reacts to images. So if, if we say, I don't want to hit in that sand trap, it increases the likelihood <laughs> that it's going to go in the sand trap <clears throat> uh, because that's the last image our mind had. If you instead say, I really, I'm going to hit the green, I'm going to hit it right there, it may go in the sand trap. But much more likely, it'll go in the direction that you want. And to me, in, in the spiritual life, in the tradition of 2,000 years, there are times when traditions and people can get so focused on the sand trap, that's all I can think about. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. That's bad. That's bad. Um, there's a delightful book I read a couple years ago called God's Secretaries, The Making of the King James Bible. And it's a terrific book about these different personalities in England at the time that came together to write the King James Bible. And um, there were some Church of England people who were kind of defending the establishment of the Church of England. And then there were these Puritans who were very intent about purifying everything. And he um, talks about how for the Puritans, daily spending a lot of time accounting for your sin was an important part of your life. And he quotes in one part about this one guy's journal. He would spend an hour or two every day going through the last day thinking of all the things that he shouldn't have thought about. And sometimes he'd even be weeping because he was just focusing on it so much. And it's stuff like, I walked by that grove of pear trees and I really wanted to take a pear, you know. I was really bored at the chapel yesterday, <laughs> you know. That so-and-so sermon went on far too long. And, and it just became this whole thing all the sand traps. <laughs> and um, I understand that's important. I understand the point of that can be for us to be honest about ourselves, to not delude ourselves, to recognize uh, the consequences of choices and that there are forces in the world that aren't so good. But I'm, I'm focusing more on the grace on the green <laughs> than the bad spirit in the sand trap, okay? Uh, it's just at this point in my life, that's where I'm going. Having said that, <clears throat> I do want to now turn to this passage um, in which uh, Jesus has a very vivid encounter with the devil. And um, it's a very important uh, that this comes right after his baptism. As we know, in his baptism, whatever he was thinking when he came out of the water, he came out and he saw the heavens open and he saw the dove and he heard the voice saying, you are my beloved son in whom I delight. With you I am well pleased and this incredible infusion of God's love as, as, as a father to his son. And it is, he's full of this love. And then, as we'll see, the spirit drives him out into the wilderness. So it's, it's not an accident, and it's not at a, really a low point in his life. It's almost maybe an incredible point when he is, with all of his searching that he'd been doing, now knows his, 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 his destiny and his identity. So let's see what happens. <clears throat> Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them, he was hungry. Now 40 days and nights, of course, uh, children of Israel, 40, day, 40 years in the wilderness and different times, that was a biblical time for a long time. Um, if you're familiar with Native American tradition, vision quests often are at least four days without food or water. Um, but the idea is that we start 
taking away all these little distractions and all these things that keep our mind uh, occupied until we really become very bare um, with, with our identity and who we are. And for Jesus, he spent that time um, preparing for this conversation. I love it in Mark's gospel, it says that he was, during this time, he was ministered to by the angels and wild animals, you know? That he, this idea that there were na- animals and nature around and, and spiritual beings and that they, they were supporting him and helping him. But then, after this time of really being worn very empty and, and at the limits of the flesh, of physical endurance, the devil appears. The devil said to him, If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And of course, Jesus is hungry. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority, all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. So it's incredible power over the worldly domain. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. So this conversation with this presence and artists have often portrayed it over the centuries. I love uh, Rembrandt's etching. Uh, in Rembrandt's etching, Jesus is just kind of hunched over and this menacing figure is kind of behind him. It's like he could feel a presence, nothing visual, but he could feel it like sometimes we can feel things like that. But the key is, is that there was this genuine temptation, these decisions that he, he had to make. And then each time, of course, he chose not what he was being offered, but he chose his fidelity to God. I asked, um, I asked a, a, a friend, a, a fellow named Bart Tarman, this week, I said, Bart, how did, how, how did you handle you know, uh, the devil and evil uh, in your time? Because he, he's, he's, he's a wise fellow. And this is what Bart sent me, so I'm sharing uh, his words. Some people see Satan in a literal sense as a fallen angel who is tempting us away from God. Others see Satan as a metaphorical personification of our own leanings toward evil and away from God. The name Satan actually has a metaphorical meaning which is accuser. So, whether you take it as a personification of interior and exterior temptation and evil or at temptations of a literal fallen being, the practical question is the same. How do we stay true to the North Star of God's love and sufficiency? So however we want to interpret it, how do we stay true to these things that may mislead us, these, wherever these voices come from? And Bart said, I, um, I think I also stressed that we are always tempted to think that we are not enough, that we are not fully loved, and that we don't have enough. But in God, we are enough and have enough. So it's a story, and it's a way to frame it that makes us think whatever, how we interpret the source of these temptations, the point is for us to be able to choose what's right and, 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 and not uh, in directions that'll mislead us. And if we look back at these um, temptations that Jesus has, um, they are clearly kind of, I will grant you immediate satisfaction over something that is very pleasing to human beings uh, in exchange for um, you know, uh, allegiance to me. So if you're really hungry and you can instantly change something to bread into bread, that's really hard not to do, of course. So this is restraint. And uh, this idea that all the kingdoms of the world will, will be yours, uh, I can give those to you. Um, that feeling of power, um, 
I was thinking today, this week, about power and what power feels like. Certainly nothing what that kind of power would feel like. But I thought, what's my first experience of power? And this, again, this is almost as trivial as the sand trap example. But I was thinking about the first time after I'd gotten my driver's license, I was able to drive myself to high school. And I got in my car, my 63 Plymouth Valiant, and I drove it down my driveway, and I was all on my own driving around. And I could turn the radio on and go back and forth between the rock and roll stations. And that feeling of, I'm driving, I'm powerful, it's a great feeling. And at times in our life, we may come into positions of power, and it can be daunting, but there can also be something that feels pretty strong about it. And certainly in this temptation, the idea is, imagine having kind of almost unlimited power, how compelling that would be, our ego would say, yes, let's do that, it'll feel great and I can handle it. But our soul says, no, 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 that's, that's, that's misleading, that's putting yourself in the place of God, focus on God, worship on God, worship, focus on serving God. And then even coming up to the temple and being tossed down and being saved, that's almost, you know, a, a, um, a temptation to do something remarkable that people will talk about and make you famous but it's just building you up. So Jesus, no, 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 you don't tempt God that way. You don't set things out there seeing if God will fulfill ideas that you have that you'd like to do that'll puff yourself up. So Jesus passes through these, and I think over the years, one thing that I've um, found helpful is that someplace I read that you can certainly use the word temptation, but also another word is tempered. Tempered, and maybe you've heard this, but you think of tempered glass. That's glass that just in its natural state could easily crack and break. But tempered glass has been treated especially with some stress and some heat and things to make it really tough. And tempered steel, good, good knives and saws and things that are tempered, that means they've been treated in a way that, that uh, makes them extremely strong and resilient. And so one way to look at this experience is the tempering, the being made stronger so that when these other um, choices come, come at Jesus and any of us, we already have experienced, we've, we, we've been stronger by going through these exercises. So um, having said that, um, I want to turn to some examples of, of people who um, I think come to mind talking about uh, temptation and tempering and, and doing what's right. Really, this weekend, I think of two pretty great presidents, Washington and Lincoln. And although neither one of theirs it would necessarily be a, 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 just a story of faith, they had a deep faith and they had convictions. And I think of, of Washington, how after winning the war as the general, he became the first president. And in the first inauguration, they wanted to treat him like a king, you know, with, with carriages and all this procession. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. We're not doing the king thing. And, and even after his second term, some people wanted him to, to almost be president for life. And he goes, no, no, he, he, did, he believed in restraint. He believed in doing his job, but knowing where the limits were when he come to them, he would be able to stand back and say, I'm, I've done my service, but I'm, I'm, I don't need to go there anymore. I don't need to be president anymore. And I think of Lincoln and all he had to deal with, the complexities, the tragedies in his own life and all, as we know so well, the complexities of the Civil War. And as you may know, Lincoln um, never officially joined a church because he didn't necessarily want to associate himself with any particular tradition, or he, 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 was, he was very skeptical of preachers that thought they knew God's mind perfectly, because <laughs> he thought it, was comp it must be complicated, it must not be so easy, so he stayed away from that. Um, but uh, amazing story is that um, there was a particular Presbyterian pastor uh, in, a, in a church not far from um, the White House who Lincoln had heard, and here this fellow really struggled with some of the complexities of providence. How has God worked things out? And apparently, for a time during the Civil War, Lincoln had made a special arrangement that he would be kind of um, without any Public, public knowing, he would come into the pastor's study at that church and they would open the door to the library and he would sit in there and he could listen to the pastor having his Bible study with the people as they talked about, how do we find God's will? How do we find the providence? He's always, Lincoln always looking for what was right and what was moral, again, with a great sense of restraint. And to the point 
after seeing all of this tragedy inflicted, of course, his second inaugural is with malice toward none, with charity toward all. So some of the, I want to lift up these folks, the, 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 the ability to take power, but use it well, knowing the limits on our own um, ego and our responsibilities. It's a beautiful thing in public life. And um, grateful to be celebrating Lincoln and Washington this weekend. Okay, so much for um, politics and history. <laughs> Personal thing that comes to mind is um, I had the privilege over the last decade or so of uh, knowing first John Loveless and then Lillian, his, his widow, um, and uh, was close to her these last 10 years before she just died last month. And um, John Loveless had uh, inherited his father's uh, business um, and he built it up, uh, the Capital Group uh, had an amazing record of building up this ex extraordinary business. He was one of the first to take mutual funds uh, going into Asia when China was still uh, um, walled off from any investing. But I was privileged to be at a memorial service for John some years ago where some of his colleagues spoke. And um, one of them said, <clears throat> one of John's rules is don't ever be greedy. Another rule was always take the long view. Don't be greedy. It's almost like that temptation to kind of go for things quickly. Don't be greedy. Take the long view. And he was apparently a great respecter of other people. Uh, one of his colleagues said in all the years he'd seen John let people go, and he never treated anyone without dignity. So he built this incredible uh, financial uh, institution, but he did it with restraint, avoiding greed, <laughs> of, of, of avoiding quick fixes, did it with integrity. Now, I'm going to come back to our lives here, um, those of us here in Summerlin listening and those present, um, because this is this Lenten journey that we're starting today. And when I look at uh, ourselves on our journey, um, I was looking at the pastors and I, th I said, I, I think when we're on a journey, there's maybe three things that we want to think about. And I kind of like the rhythm here, so I'm going to say, you start with the love, you bring the tribe, and you trust the guide. Okay? Now start with the love. When we're going on a journey, especially if it's a hard personal journey, some decision we're making or something we're having to deal with, as Bart said, I think what's really important is that we start with the love, God's love for us. Jesus, before he went out into that wilderness, he was filled with God's love. And being filled with that love helps us be, have the restraint from doing foolish things. And I think for all of us um, today here as we start this journey, I hope that we all remember as our first step that we claim the love that we've been given through the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And it, we experience it in this community. And while we're all gonna be invited to be on our own journey, I'm gonna encourage us all to be praying for each other in the next 40 days uh, for whatever journey different ones of us are on, that the love will be beneath everything. And it's really about, the journey is as much about finding even more love than we knew was there. Every time we come back, we find new ways. Secondly, bring the tribe that on the one hand, this is a, a, a journey we make on our own, but how important it is to know there are other people on the journey with us. So often in pilgrimages, people sometimes can go on individual pilgrimages, but there's often groups of pilgrims going. Um, and I think in the Native American tradition, when on vision quests or these kinds of things, you've been prepared by the people in your tribe, people who love and care for you and want to see you find your deeper identity. And there even the belief that the, even some of the elders that have gone on are there kind of cheering you on. So it's, it's our individual journey that we're on. But let's imagine there's, we're, 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 there's a group of us all traveling together, starting from the foundation of that same love, that's limitless love. We've all got our work to do, things to figure out. But we've also got each other to be on this journey. And finally, to trust the guide. Jesus is the trailblazer. Um, 
Jesus' example and the way he showed restraint and knowing to, when to um, put off things that would be tempting to do short-term solutions. He's always looking for that deeper relationship with God to trust that guide. And then, two stories that uh, come to mind as I think about these things. And I'll try to stop saying this, but um, I do worry that I'm repeating stories uh, the longer I'm here. And so, some, of you, some of you will find out when you get older, you start repeating stories. And I kind of keep checking on my expiration date, thinking how much longer before all it is is repeated stories. So I don't know if I've told these stories, but they're the ones that come to mind. This is what I got. First one is that when we're on these kind of journeys, it's how important it is to do it as a, as a tribe, as a group, instead of just by ourselves. There are wonderful retreat centers around and uh, monasteries and different places we can go. And as some of you know, I was associated with La Casa de Maria for, for a, a long time until the mud flow shut it down. And, um, you know, 140 people would come to those 26 acres up in Montecito. And some of them were on, like, um, strategic planning things or other kinds of team building. But for a lot of folks, it was a person. It was like sitting out into a wilderness where they're leaving behind all the distractions and everything and the, the media and the news and all that, shutting off the phone, all those kinds of things. And then it becomes a little, one becomes uh, a little vulnerable. But you're surrounded by this acreage and this presence that has been saturated in prayer and meditation and love and, and devotion for 50, 60 years. And if you're there, you know that everybody there, whether they'll give you your space, but if you wanna reach out, there are people to help you if you got something that's, that's really burdening you. And one story <coughs> that I remember, is that uh, uh, at this beautiful stone house uh, that was for private retreats in the center of the property, people would come there to be on their own and they could uh, be in silence the whole weekend if they wanted, but there were dinners around a dining table every night. Um, and there was a great spiritual director who was in residence there. But sometimes if she wasn't there and somebody wanted spiritual direction, they'd think, eh, let's ask lefties. I mean, they, I was down there as an administrator down in the office, but uh, you know, he. Steve's a minister guy, let's see if he can help this person. So I was always privileged to be interrupted from my administrative work to go and sit with somebody and see if I could help him. And I, I got a call one afternoon to come up and see this woman, um, which I did, and when I met with her, um, we prayed first, and then I said, well, tell me what's up. And she was um, getting near the end of her life. She had a terminal cancer and, and she knew that that was happening but she just had wanted to come and spend a couple of days to, um, to be uh, in this sacred space and uh, the night before she had gotten her dinner plate and was coming back into the kitchen and she tripped and, and uh, fell and broke the dish and it was embarrassing of course but what she said was she actually afterwards felt like maybe there was some evil force that had caused her to trip and be humiliated this way. And so she was just really concerned about that. So I sat with her for a while and I, after a while I said, what about your spiritual background? She goes, oh, I, I was raised um, Catholic. <laughs> um, she said, my, my parents didn't go to mass much, but at about eight years old, I really started to want to go. And so as a child, I just started going all the time. And I really felt that I was a home for me. And I said, if that happened to you when you were eight, that means that God claimed you when you were a child and you belonged to God. And there is no force in this world that can separate you from the love of God. And I was surprised I said that, <laughs> but it was true. And I could see the anxiety start to kind of dissipate. And sometimes when we're tempted, um, we've been claimed by God, by the love of God that knows no, no, no darkness. And that's a permanent claim. <laughs> and we should stand on that and hold it. And the second story has to do with a, a high school retreat experience that my Goleta Church uh, was involved in for a number of years called uh, the Love of God Retreat. And um, 
like I said, perhaps I've shared this story before, but I hadn't known much about it by the time I came in the early 90s to, to uh, the Goleta Church, but it was a thriving youth ministry, and a lot of it was built around twice a year they'd have these very intense weekend retreats, and they'd get 40, 50 teenagers, and they usually had a team of about 10 or 12 teenagers who had been through it before, who are now the leaders for the next group. Adults were there, but more or less just to help the kids lead it themselves. Um, and it was such a powerful thing. They would come up, up the hill um, on Friday night and people would be greeted and some kids were there like, I don't even know if I really want to be here. And other kids were excited. They'd heard good things about it. They didn't really know what happened to that retreat. But for the first probably 24 hours are all the frenetic things that youth uh, retreats do of all kinds of mixers and games and everything else. Hopefully just kind of exhaust all that, take all that energy and spend some of it. But more and more, people, the kids that were there started feeling that they, this was a special place and there was something really wonderful going on. And then late in the afternoon, they had what they called obstacles. And they would be in a big room and have everybody sit in a circle. And they would just very simply say, this is our obstacles circle. And at this time, any, if you have an event, something going on in your life that you feel is an obstacle keeping you from the love of God, if you want to, you can share it, something that you're struggling with. So as most of those things go, I think it often, I was never there during that. It was not a time for anybody to be, even if I was the pastor of the, no, it, was, it was not my place to be in the middle of that retreat at that time. That was a confidential thing for the kids. But the adults were there keeping an eye on things. But as kids went around, maybe if someone would start, you know, some difficulty even happened in school, somebody else would be talking about, um, you know, their parents' divorce, somebody else, might start talking about some abusive situation they'd been in. And pretty soon, it became pretty powerful as this group of kids, not all of them had to share, it was purely optional, but started to have a chance to get that out. And to look around the circle and these other kids you'd see going down the high school campus or something, you think, oh, they got their act together. In fact, they've been going through all kinds of stuff. So you see this, the, 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 the struggles of the human spirit as a teenager, you see it in that circle but it's all done in being held in love with the focus of, given this has happened to us, how do we deepen our love and knowledge of God? So after that intense experience, they would kind of take a break, and then um, they'd have dinner, and then they'd come back into the chapel, and the chapel, meanwhile, had been totally decorated with Christmas lights and all kinds of beautiful food and everything. And they would read this story, um, and it might have been a C.S. Lewis story, you might have heard it, about heaven and hell. And uh, the idea is that somebody wants to see what both of them are like. So they get on the elevator, they go down below, and they, the door opens and they see all these people and there's all this food everywhere, but everybody's starving. They have really long forks and they're really frustrated because they're trying to feed themselves and they can't do it. And then, going up, <laughs> get up to the upper level, open the door, Lots of food, lots of tables, but everybody is happy because they're feeding each other. They're taking these long forks and feeding each other. Would you like some? Yeah. So it became all about this metaphor of, of there's where it is. We spend so much time trying to feed. Our, but to feed one another in the midst of the love of God circle. And so the rule was, there was all kinds of goodies out there, but the kids couldn't, you had to have somebody else give it to you. <laughs> so you learn this, would you please, yes, and then you give and take and give and take. And then they had a beautiful worship service, and when the kids went back to the rooms that night, unbeknownst to them, for weeks prior to this, 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 this um, retreat, people on the team had been contacting family and friends of, say, if I was a young person, and asking them to write letters of affirmation to me, so I'd come back to my little bunk bed and I'd hit all these letters from people in my life telling them how much I mean to them and, and, and how they've always loved and admired me even as a kid. So what's that like to go from that breaking open to realizing that we're all sharing all these burdens and, and challenges, but the love of God can hold them all. And the love of God, we're brought into something beyond those issues. It's a time in the wilderness that becomes an opening to true life. And when I asked our leader in well, the first few years, does this really have a strong effect on kids? 
and he said, he said, well, one time at the end of the retreat, you write down what you learned, and Megan Ashby, I say her name with pride, Megan Ashby, who had been subject to a lot of depression, socially isolated in high school, had come reluctantly to that retreat. But as that retreat over, what she wrote was, I know now that God wants me to live. I know now that God wants me to live. And after that retreat, Megan was an amazingly composed, she became one of the leaders. She, she finished college at UCSB but continued to be involved because she'd experienced that. She'd walked into that where the love was already there waiting and connected with a tribe <laughs> of other people one's age. But then really focused on following the guide, the trail guide, Jesus going through that, knowing that if he is with her, who can be against her? So, <clears throat> there we are. As we begin this Lenten time, um, the team and I thought, we'll have a time of contemplation now. They'll be singing here in a minute. Uh, they'll be singing a song. And that's, I think since Bart left, we haven't had a time of anointing, and I've always loved privilege to be anointing. So I've got some anointing oil over there, and if um, while they're singing, you're welcome to just stay where you are and think about your own journey, praying for God's, God's leading, wherever, whatever issue you want to bring forth. Pray for other folks here too, wherever their journey is. And if you want, you're welcome to come forward, and I'll take a little bit of oil, and I'll anoint you with the sign of the cross, and I'll say simply, Christ will hold you fast. Christ will hold you fast. Let us pray. Oh Lord, everything your son went through was for us to show the depth and breadth of his love, your love for us. We want to claim that here this morning, Lord. We want to claim that love that goes before us, that's already put a claim on us. We want to claim the power of our community, our fellow pilgrims on this journey. And as we go through these next days and weeks, we just want to keep our eyes every day focused on where you want to lead us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So our journey begins. Let us be praying for our own deepening in the next uh, 40 days and nights and praying for each other. We're all on this journey. We've all got things we're dealing with, but we're together. And that same divine love is holding all of us and wanting us to only know more and more deeply how real and tangible it is. So let's go on this journey together, knowing that we are led further and further into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, infinite love of God, and the healing and empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. And all the people say, Amen. Amen. Ashamed I hear my voice. 